Ah, the Duchess of Monte Shitshow. A real life princess amongst mortals. Her most coveted possession is her voice. Other than her privacy, of course. A privacy she holds so dear, she was forced to flee the terrible British royal family with her prince and her title in tow. Free from the reign of terror, with her passport, keys, and driver's license at hand, this savior, akin to the likes of Nelson Mandela, is finally using her voice and is speaking her truth after being silenced for so long. <laughs> yeah, right. Welcome back to the channel, everyone. Welcome if you're new. Thank you for joining me, Pluto, to talk about the cut. It's like every time we think that she couldn't possibly get worse, or at least that's what I think, you know, with that first podcast with Serena Williams. And yes, I listened to the Diva podcast. We'll discuss that on the podcast next week. But seriously, every time this woman releases something, I just think, could she possibly get any worse? There is no way. But malignant narcissist that she is. She has no concept of how she looks to the world, how she presents to the world. And the way she's presenting keeps getting crazier and crazier. I mean, let's start off with the timing of this article. It hasn't gone unnoticed that it was released pretty much a couple of days before the anniversary of Princess Diana's passing on the 31st of August. Coincidence? I think not. I don't think anything Meghan Markle does is a coincidence. Secondly, that cover or the title, The Duchess. One of my favorite movies is called The Duchess, by the way, starring Keira Knightley. It came out when I was a kid. Oh my God, I watched that movie on repeat. I don't even know if a child was meant to watch it, but that's what it reminded me of when I read the title. And if you read the body of the article, yeah, she's bad mouthing the British royal family once again because that is her only claim to fame. You know, to quote Mariah Carey, why is so obsessed with me? <laughs> the elephant in the room. Privacy. I don't think any of us have forgotten the reason that she and Harry have decided to step back from the royal family and proceed with Megxit, that sexist term, that dirty, dirty term. It was all in the name of privacy. Never mind the fact that we saw them in 2020 via Zoom and random photo ops during charitable endeavors more times than we ever saw them in the royal family while they were actually senior working royals. If you can even call her a senior working royal, that woman barely had 72, I think, events, engagements in the, what, year and a half that she was there. All of that, of course, culminating, leading up to that infamous interview. So carrying on in the tradition of the Oprah interview, she once again completely ignores the polarity, the hypocrisy of her own words by insisting on introducing herself and being referred to as the Duchess while calling the very family that bestowed that title and that honor upon her racist, sexist, old-fashioned, rigid, etc 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 institution as for the photos there are a lot of comparisons with Catherine's portraits for her 40th birthday of course Catherine looks like an ethereal goddess i mean megan doesn't look bad don't get me wrong i've always said that she is beautiful i do not knock other women just for the sake of it in fact i'm not knocking megan i am criticizing her behavior her evil toxic selfish behavior but appearance wise yeah She's beautiful. My favorite is, I think, the one of her right here. I'll put it up on the screen where she is on some sort of a bench. But she's a beautiful woman. I'm never going to deny that. But that doesn't cut it. That doesn't give you an excuse to act like a rotten piece of turd. Did you get the reference? Just because you're beautiful and you're a woman. So, Megan of Monte I mean, sorry, Montecito. She's left the firm behind. I don't think so. I mean, can you really leave the firm behind if you keep bringing them up every single chance you can get? They've moved on. Megan's the one who was unable to because, like I said, they're her claim to fame. 
From the very first paragraph, there is a very colorful description of her kid. Now, again, I thought that the whole point was to shield their children from the press, from the media, from the uh, goldfish bowl. Next, we immediately move on to criticizing the royal family for how rigid they are and how Meghan was unable to craft her own image in social media like she was used to when she was a two-bit actress. Not that we ever doubted it or needed any confirmation, but this article really emphasizes how much of a control freak she is. And this is where the first inflammatory lie, an absolute lie, emanates. She complains that she wanted control over what images she would release, when she would release them, and who would get to see them first. Amongst these images were photos of her children. And this is what she had to say on that. Why would I give the very people that are calling my children the N-word a photo of my child before I can share it with the people that love my child? Have I been sleeping under a rock the past three years since the birth of Archie? What, what is she talking about? This is an actual lie. First of all, both her children are white. I mean, in this article, it opens up with this description of Archie as a ginger, just like his father. Later in the article, Lily is described, again, as this blue-eyed white child. What is she talking about? This woman lies very much in the same way as the Oprah interview. This is proof that she just doesn't learn. She doesn't learn no matter what she does, no matter what backlash she gets, no matter how many people out her with actual facts, with the truth, not our truth or their truth, the truth, she doesn't care. Now she says, oh, I'm coming back to Instagram at the start of the article and there's this devilish, you know, look in her eyes. But then later in the article, the reporter says, oh, she kind of goes, I'm not too sure about it. The reason I'm bringing this up is because she had proclaimed multiple times that social media is toxic. It should come with a warning. People shouldn't be free to say whatever they want to say. It should be controlled. There should be more policing and that she is sick and tired of all the bullying and toxicity that exists in the realm of social media. So she pretty much contradicts herself and goes, oh, I'm coming back to Instagram. Honestly, I couldn't care less if she joins Instagram or not. It's her prerogative. I mean, does it go against the privacy argument? Of course, it depends. You can have your Instagram set to private. You know, you can be a celebrity with a private life. But I doubt that's what Megan wants because she wouldn't have announced it in this article if she was just going for a private Instagram. In fact, she would probably already have one that no one knows about except for her nearest and dearest. But no, that's never enough for Megan. That's not the point for Megan. There's no point to having an online presence or a global presence if she doesn't get to show off and flex. Something else that really stood out to me is the number of times she really wanted to emphasize how she and Harry were always together. You know, she and Harry are soulmates and they're attached at the hip and she talks about in one paragraph how Harry saw two palm trees that are connected at the bottom and he goes my love it's us there's this other time when she talks about how she's teaching Archie manners I mean I really hope that there is a nanny to teach him as well because I, I don't think Meghan Markle knows what manners are based on the way she's been treating everyone in her life including the royal family and her parents, but she says, oh, I, you know, you have to teach them manners and there's salt and pepper, it goes together. And that's me and Harry, we're salt and pepper. We always go together. I don't know, I might be reading too much into it, but I have a unique perspective, I guess, of being part of a couple, a coupling, Zach and I, who are inseparable, but this is the first time I've said it. And I'm only saying it because if you're secure in your relationship, you don't feel the need to say multiple times how inseparable you are. I don't know. It just came across like so 14 year old, so high school. Oh, look, my love, it's us. It's kind of like someone who says, I'm a great person. I'm a good person. I'm a charitable person. And then you wonder why you keep saying that. Are you trying to convince yourself? People tell me and Zach that we're inseparable. They tell us how cute it is, or how do you do it, how do you live together, work together, do everything together, because we're best friends. But again, it's not something we announce, it's something people observe and comment on, rather than making it a thing. The next little comment. Now this one really made me cringe. I was reading this on my phone, so I had to put the phone down at this point. 
Brace yourselves. Even if she and Harry have stepped back from the royal duties, Meghan is still very aware that people see her as a princess. It's important to be thoughtful about it because even with the Oprah interview, I was conscious of the fact that there are little girls that I meet and they're just like, oh my God, it's a real life princess. But her ambitions for herself and the little girls who look up to her are more than to marry into a position. Should I have warned you to get a puke bucket first? I mean, is this a 41 year old? There's this thing I'm noticing, this trend I'm noticing with women like Megan and her personality disorders or apparent personality disorders because I'm not a psychologist, I can't diagnose her. But they're very childish, they're very immature and they have a very shallow perception and understanding of the world. The reason that we dub her speeches, her ramblings as word salad is because they lack depth and meaning. It's all shallow, but then so are her emotions. She just comes across to me as so flowery, so overly descriptive, you know, in the same way that her blog, The Tig, was written. Everything is just so fanciful and so exaggerated. But this princess thing immediately reminded me of their time in Harlem when she decided to dress in thousands of dollars worth of clothing, probably millions of dollars worth of jewelry, I don't know, show up to a school at Harlem and read her book to the students there. And I remember her saying, oh, little girls were asking me at the school, are you a real princess? And she said, yes. I don't even know if that story's true, but it just, leaves a bad taste in one's mouth considering where she was at the time. And I highly doubt that there are little girls out there, little girls under 10, who walk around and see Megan and gasp and go, oh my God, it's a real life princess. I'm gonna jump ahead quite a bit in the article to a little comment that Megan made about when she went back to Frogmore Cottage during the Jubilee visit to pack up the rest of her things. She says it was bittersweet, you know? knowing none of it had to be this way. She's right, none of it had to be this way. But who made it this way? Well, of course, according to Meghan, the royal family, because she's never wrong. Nothing is ever her fault. How did it get so hard? She had tried to play royal. I was an actress, she says. My entire job was tell me where to stand, tell me what to say, tell me how to say it, tell me what to wear, and I'll do it. And I'll show up early, and I'll probably bake something for the crew except you failed even at that, because they told you where to stand. They told you what to say, how to say it, what to wear, but you were having none of it. But don't call her a diva. Don't call her a diva or she'll have a meltdown. The article goes on to say that her desire to ask lots of questions and to never be involved with something she couldn't totally have her hands on seemed to violate an unspoken social norm. Do we have to play her engagement interview on repeat for her? You know, put it on in her headphones while she sleeps at night so that she can remember that she herself said. But I, I don't see it as giving anything up. I just see it as a it's change. A, it's, a new, it's a new challenge. It's a new, it's a new chapter. Maybe she has amnesia. Now, according to Megan, their very existence seemed to be upsetting the royal family. She says, just by existing, we were upsetting the dynamic of the hierarchy. She goes on to repeat that assertion that there are many other royals without naming a single one who are living that half in, half out life where they get to have their cake and eat it too. But because it was them, because it was Megan in particular, because she was a half black American with a voice, the royal family said no. The reporter actually asks her, why do you think that is? Why is it that other members could do it and you couldn't? And Megan says, why do you think that is? And she says it right back with a side eye that suggests the reporter should understand without having to be told. I wanna to make a quick comment on this photo before I move on and forget. Apparently, Harry's ex Chelsea posed in a very similar setup, very similar location, and a very similar outfit beforehand. But again, a very common trait in people like her with her personality tendencies. They don't have a sense of self, so they just latch on to whatever it is or whomever it is they wanna emulate. It's very unnerving for the other side, trust me. I would know. Next, they touch upon the podcast. Yep, archetypes. 
Megan is happy for the podcast to be her reintroduction. Reintroduction? I'm sorry. Am I living in a simulation? You never disappeared. She and Harry were playing a game of whack-a-mole during COVID and beyond. You just couldn't get rid of them. Don't you have to have a hiatus or disappear to be reintroduced? She goes on to describe the podcast as so real. I watched an interview with Samantha Markle, who obviously knows her sister. And not that we need Samantha to tell us this because I think it's pretty obvious, but real? Her very voice, every single thing, the tone, the delivery, all of it is perfectly manufactured and curated to come across as this airy, breathy, seductive, kind, friendly, amiable person. Sickly sweet, that's just the name of the game. The sicklier, the better. Is that even a word, sicklier? So the reporter describes the podcast, the conversation with Serena and Megan specifically, as hovering between candid and planned. I didn't get any candid other than from Serena. And then with Mariah, it would be candid from Mariah because everything Megan says is scripted. <laughs> Another part where I had to get up, but I've got good news following on this absurdity. I'm sure you all knew that where I was going with this. Yep, that Nelson Mandela comparison. She recalls a moment from the 2019 London premiere of the live action version of The Lion King. I just had Archie. It was such a cruel chapter. I was scared to go out. Let's pause here for photos, insert photos. Wimbledon, bam, US Open, bam, scared to go out, bam. <laughs> Does she live in a simulation? A cast member from South Africa pulled her aside. He looked at me and he's just like light. He said, I just need you to know, when you married into this family, we rejoiced in the streets the same we did when Mandela was freed from prison. Now, many people have already commented on the absurdity of this comparison. Recently, an article was released with the only South African cast member of The Lion King. And he says he'd never even met the woman. This conversation never happened. It's another manufactured lie. And do you know why it never happened, by the way? Why he never met her? Because he wasn't even there. He wasn't even at the premiere. His name is Dr. Connie, and he voiced Rafiki in the movie. And as if that wasn't bad enough, Dr. Connie goes on to state that their wedding, Harry and Meghan's wedding, wasn't even a big deal in South Africa. He goes on to say, in my memory, nobody would have known when she got married, when or what. We had no South African link to the wedding or to her marrying Harry. I am truly surprised by this. For me, it is a non-event, the whole thing. The cut has been approached by the Daily Mail to comment on this, and they refused. It's what you get for putting lies out there without fact-checking, without verifying, like the Vanity Fair article. I'm not a fan of any of these publications, but the fact that the Vanity Fair article refused to publish any of her fake unfounded charitable deeds and even the Procter & Gamble soap ad story because they couldn't verify it for the life of them, it makes me and others respect them more and hey, maybe the next time I read an article on Vanity Fair, if I ever do, maybe there's some credibility behind it because of the fact-checking process. The cut? You're just enablers. You're just a fancier version of People magazine. And did the reporter question the story? Did the reporter go ahead and fact check? No. And they call themselves reporters? I mean, has Oprah Winfrey set the standard now in the US? You just accept things no matter how far-fetched and ridiculous they sound without fact checking before publishing them? Oh, and guess what's brought up again in this very article? The Bot Sentinel report from last October. Remember when we covered that in the podcast? Remember when we divulged that Twitter itself said that that report was unfounded? There are no bots. It's real people criticizing a woman behaving badly on the public stage, on the world stage. They have the right to do that within limits. But you know what we do that makes us different from the mainstream media? We fact check, realize that there's a discrepancy, and call it out. That's not harassment. What you sugars do in my comment section and the comment section of other creators, that's harassment. I really feel like someone needs to hand Megan and her disciples a dictionary.
Maybe then they can look up what bullying means, what harassment means, what racism is, what sexism is, what ambition is, what a stereotype is and what an archetype is, and what privacy is. Because whatever it is, this ain't it. And the final inflammatory comment. Megan's claim that Harry said that he'd lost his father. Now, she said this to the reporter, knowing that it would probably make it in the article. Specifically, she says, Harry said to me, I lost my dad in this process. She then goes on to say, it doesn't have to be the same for them as it was for me, but that's his decision. It's funny, I feel like Harry's relationship with his father was on the mend and only getting better and better until you came along, Megan. And why does that sound familiar to me? Who else had a really good relationship with her father? Thanking him and gushing about him and including him in all of her stories until she met Harry. You haven't lost your dad, Harry. I am very certain he adores you still. In fact, when you said he cut you off financially, according to the Tom Bauer book, the audits revealed that he actually gave you more than a million pounds after Megxit. So that was another lie. She made another unfounded comment about how if she stayed within the royal family, there would be a photo op, a press call every time she dropped off her kids to school, which is a lie because Catherine and William drop off their kids to school. And uh, quite frankly, what, we see maybe two photos every few years? There isn't a whole uproar. There isn't a whole ruckus surrounding the issue because Harry would know specifically that there are agreements with the media when it comes to royal children. Harry and William themselves were protected by such an agreement when they were at Eton and Harry himself couldn't explain that to Meghan or maybe he did or maybe he's just enabling her. I mean if there's one thing that's really obvious with these two is that they are both each other's echo chamber. They're both enabling each other and it's pretty twisted. Oh, and uh, didn't you orchestrate this photo op, Megan, while you were dropping Archie off to preschool? They close off the article with more delusion, with more statements that make me feel that one of us is living in a simulation in the Matrix. It's interesting. I've never had to sign anything that restricts me from talking, she reveals. I can talk about my whole experience and make a choice not to. And when the reporter asks her, why don't you talk? She says, still healing. What was the Oprah interview then? <laughs> or did that never happen too? Is she going to pretend that never happened? Like she pretends a lot of the stuff from her past never happened? Is she going to pretend that that was a figment of our imagination and we're gaslighting her? And how does the reporter not bring this up? It's like, what do you mean you haven't been talking? You haven't stopped talking since. And we end off on forgiveness because Megan knows all about forgiveness, right, Thomas Markle? Right? Right, everyone else from both sides of the family? Now, this question was specifically in relation to forgiving her in-laws because, yeah, they've done things that warrant forgiveness, apparently, from Meghan Markle. Look, I have no allegiance to the royal family whatsoever. In fact, I credit Meghan Markle for even sparking my interest in them. I had zero interest in the royal family beforehand, so I've got no skin in the game. If they were actually racist and misogynist, that's disgusting and I would absolutely call it out as someone who has actually personally been subjected to racism and misogyny. But as far as the public record is aware and concerned, the royal family have done nothing but welcome her, love her, include her, give her privileges that Catherine never dreamed of getting very early on in her relationship with Harry. So Megan says, I think forgiveness is really important. It takes a lot more energy to not forgive, but it takes a lot of effort to forgive. I've really made an active effort, especially knowing that I can say anything. You sure can. And for some reason, everything you say is either a lie or bashing, bad mouthing a family that has, like I said, treated you well, welcomed you, even gave you a 12-month review period after Megxit to welcome you back after everything you've done. They let you keep your titles, the very titles that you rely on for your very existence as you know it. Meghan Markle, do you think you'd have the Archetypes podcast if it wasn't for your association with the royal family? Do you think you'd be on the cover of The Cut 
if it wasn't for your association with the royal family? Do you think Oprah Winfrey would have given you the time of day if it wasn't for your association with the royal family? All the houses of fashion that have been dressing her, all the access to the jewels and the clothes and the house, the mansion that she currently lives in. Do you think you would have any of those things without your association with the royal family? Oh, and let's not forget the most lucrative deal of them all, Netflix. I think she knows the truth, and that's why she can't help but keep bringing them up. She needs to make that mullah. I think only someone as deeply disturbed as Meghan Markle could ruin such a golden opportunity as marrying into the royal family and becoming a senior royal. Out of the blue, in record time, from nothing. And that's it for this video. It's a bit of a long one. I'll see what I can do with the editing. But thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the video. Looking forward to reading your comments in the comment section below. If you haven't subscribed, please do. I would really love to have you. And go ahead and like the video if you liked it. And I will catch you in the next one. Bye.